knew my husband was not going to forgive me for that ballroom dance thing. Um, hi, I'm Allison Silvius, and it's such a pleasure to be here today. I have actually been in academia for the last 15 years, and a few days from now, I'm actually leaving academia, and I'm headed off into my own journey to California, no less. And this risk-taking is not something that was ever taught to me from my education or through my family. It was actually a product of me not having space to innovate. See, I'm a fish who's actually been molded by my fellow fish, but I couldn't stop questioning what existed beyond the bowl. <laughs> you know, 4.4 million individuals have actually resigned from their jobs. And that resignation represents something. That rep it represents the desire for more opportunity in a place that has provided no space. And so with that, I want to speak to those 4.4 million and more to let you know that I understand you. I understand the desire to innovate you in a place that actually provides no space. For it is outside of these spaces, or I should actually say lack thereof, where we truly feel alive, where we feel like a new day is coming. It's actually a space where we can innovate you, really. So with that, I was, uh, you know, putting this together and I stumbled upon this quote. Roman emperor and philosopher Marcus Aurelius once stated that the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Never more has a quote actually stood out to me, for it's through obstacles and challenges that we truly succeed. See, as a social species, we are here to influence one another and shape how we behave and act. And during COVID and all of the chaos that it has actually bestowed upon us, it has done one fundamental thing. It has allowed us to stop and question what we have been doing for all of these years, sometimes even decades. It has allowed us as fish to question what we have been swimming in and ask ourselves, well, what exists beyond the bowl? See, <laughs> the why people were quitting their jobs, it made sense to me. I mean, the great resignation isn't about people just quitting. It's actually more than that. It's about minoritizing your people and creating spaces and opportunities for those that already have the power to begin with. And for those that didn't have that power or space, well, they decided to look out and ask themselves what exists beyond the bowl. Fundamentally, during COVID, they realized their own abilities, their new realities, only to be asked to come back to an organization that hasn't changed. Our organizations and its leaders have literally been asking us to jump back into a fishbowl and follow the other fish for the sake of following. It's a big problem right there. And that's one of the biggest fundamental failures of our leaders and our organizations today. For one cannot lead if there is no one to follow you. To lead, you actually have to listen to your people. And once you listen, you actually have to take action. Yet, our leaders aren't actually listening to the people. And for those that are, they're walking outside the door. They're innovating for someone else. In the spring of 2020, when COVID really hit us pretty hard, I had already started to question principles around organizational theory. And both my experience, as well as my lack of space to innovate, really allowed me to reflect on various leaders, both good and bad, taking notes of those that actually had done it really poorly. And when I think about this, I think about the university system where I came from. We are notorious in a university system for promoting people because of the degrees that they hold. But Henry Mintzberg actually notes that leaders are not actually created by the books that they read or the MBAs that they achieve, but through molded experiences. 
Well, I don't know about you, but COVID-19 has allowed us to bear witness to a true test of leadership. Now, assuming that we have two types of leaders before COVID, leader one fundamentally has never known their people. They are characterized, I would say, as um, they are reposting the job positions as soon as their people are leaving, and they're not even asking why. In fact, they're known for actually looking and going, oh, come back to the office, but not even asking for a needs assessment, what are the new needs of my workforce? Now, leader two, on the other hand, well, they know their people. I can think of one woman that exhibited the traits of this today. As a campus president, she made sure to shake the hands of every single person, including that of the maintenance staff. No person was too big and no person was too small. She made sure to balance the needs of the people that she had, the organizations that they served on, the committees that they served on. Balance the needs of her students with that of her, her employees. Now, according to a theory by Stephen J. Gould and now with Eldridge in 1972, which seems like forever ago, Evolution and change occur in punctuated births, known as punctuated equilibrium. Now, assuming our organizations and its leaders were diverse to begin with, we can expect to see a great deal of change. And that's exactly what we've started to see, denoting the great resignation. We've seen good people leave good jobs. Harvard Business Review actually found in 2021 that it was mid-career individuals aged 30 to 45, such as myself, leaving good jobs, specifically in healthcare and technology, denoting burnout. But the one thing that's been missing from the whole argument all along has been about how our leaders are actually accepting some of these various changes that must occur. And they're not. In fact, Leader one is characterized, I would say, as creating a hierarchy of those that are actually innovators and those that are leaders and those that are not. And for those that are not, they don't have that space or privilege, they're walking. It is these hindrances and impediments that Marcus Aurelius refers that create the actions of the minoritized few. The leader that stands in the way of their own people, I dare you, will mark their failure. And as such, leader one, like so many other poor leaders today, will lose out on their innovation, not because it didn't exist, but because sometimes, un unintentionally, they created little to no space for them to innovate. Let me give you an example. Back in the spring of 2020, both my husband and I decided to start a business. Very entrepreneurial. And we followed all the necessary steps. We wrote grants at night. We partnered with a local incubator. We did the whole patent thing. <laughs> and we've actually partnered with two universities, SMU and TCU. And we're actually sponsoring our SMU engineers still to this day. Having said all this, we had to do this off the radar. Because neither his job nor my job communicated a clear plan from innovation to commercialization of the rights. And furthermore, our job descriptions really actually didn't align with what we were developing at the time, which was a virtual reality tool for unbiased hiring. Now, having said all this, it illustrates two key problems with innovation today. One is that we are very much bound to job descriptions which fail to capture a person's ability to seek out entrepreneurial or innovation. And two, we are using minoritized marketing where we fail to actually represent individuals in an equitable way, sometimes suppressing them. As a way to kind of communicate that in the messaging that you actually see above, you can see where male colleagues are provided their terminal degrees, but females, including myself, have our terminal degrees left off. Now, this isn't about who has one and who doesn't. It's about consistency in your messaging. And so thus, we have organizations losing out 
on innovation because of the fact that they are letting their minoritized people just walk out the door, and sometimes using inequitable marketing. See, fundamentally, we're tied to our old ways, job descriptions and classifications of people and innovators. And for those that want to color outside the lines in our provided space, like my fellow colleagues here, they had to actually turn to their inner entrepreneur. As a byproduct of this, in 2020, unemployment actually hit 8.1%. But so did the number of new business formations. Really interesting, by the way. Digital.com found in a survey that they did on 1,250 individuals, age 18 and over, that 62% were forming a business to be their own boss. Now, my friend would actually say that's being unbossed. Mm -hmm. But 62, or 60 or 60% were actually forming a business because they had a passion for an idea. Now, that's pretty cool. But what it tells us is that our organizations, businesses, leaders, they're not really capitalizing on who they have. And those people are seeking to innovate that part of themselves. Really. So having said all this, it illustrates these problems, right? How do I innovate this part of me when I have no support and no space? And as an organization it is, how do I keep my people? How do I justify the rules that I have? How do I justify the brick and mortar walls that we might not need anymore? Now, I don't want you to worry because there are ways or strategies, I would say, but it's going to be a wild ride. First and foremost, as crazy as it sounds, you need to be prepared for fixed job descriptions to go away or be com eliminated completely. And I'm sure you're asking why. Fixed job descriptions really aren't working all that well to begin with, let me tell you. Our systems are so automated today to use natural language processing and applicant tracking systems to scan for words on resumes, okay? Now, applicant tracking systems are algorithms and they scan for words and resumes and match it to a job description to determine hireability. That's the way the system works, okay? Now, that's not really capturing a person's integrity, innovation, none of that. And even then, if the system could, we're not really actually set up to put those entrepreneurial or innovative people in the right space. Because you're so busy having them count beans on a daily basis to even try to solve new problems for you. Second, you're using minoritized marketing and you're not rewarding those that are actually staying with your organization. Harvard Business Review found in 2019 that we were, between World War II and 1970, 90% of our jobs were filled with lateral promotions. Okay, we were keeping our people and doing a good job. However, that's fallen down to less than one third today. You're letting your own people walk out the door and you're not realizing the cost of lost knowledge the organizational knowledge. All of that, you're just losing. This is, by the way, because of your dependency on number one, fixed job descriptions. And third, we have to be smart about the models that we start to use, meaning we need to start to consider data and dashboards as a way to track long-term growth and skills over time instead of seeing people as simple words on a resume. We need to be more than that. So I want to leave you with this. Assume that we have all been circling these fishbowls for a number of years, only to notice a really big ocean. For some, that ocean is really big and scary, and so it makes sense. You don't want to jump. But for those that question what exists inside that ocean, you're not alone. I, too, am that risky fish. See, for years, I devalued myself and my talents and my skills, and I realized 
that that fear was a fear that was fundamentally created by the fishbowl that I had been swimming in for so many years. And you now have a moment in time where you can actually take the leap and jump, or you can play it safe. But for those that decide that they want to play it safe, I encourage you to look to your fellow risk takers because they might have new ways of problem solving things going forward. But even more importantly, for our leaders, I encourage you to try and go catch a risky fish because they might have been swimming in that fishbowl all along and you've been just too busy swimming to even notice that they were there. Thank you.